My name is Dave Tran, and this is Lux TV, shedding and spreading light for the chiropractic student. We have chiropractor Dr. Robert Brooks in sunny Tulsa, Oklahoma. Dr. Brooks graduated from Palmer College of Chiropractic in 1970. Dr. Brooks, welcome to Lux TV. Thank you, David. Yeah. So let's get straight to it. Uh, how did you get into chiropractic? Well, you know, my story is uh, a little bit different because um, one of the questions you're going to ask me today is how do I actually, what advice would I give a student in chiropractic school? So I'm going to back this up a ways. Um, I was coming out of, well, just the whole story as I turned uh, 17 in April. I graduated high school in May. I was off to college to be a mathematician and I ran into a chiropractor who said there was a power of life inside the human body that stopped when we die and when the spine misaligned it limited the power and people had problems and when we corrected it it set the power free and people got well again and I said that's what I'm going to do with my life. I got that at age 17. Oh, wow. So by the end of September I'm enrolled in Palmer College and I'm in Davenport, Iowa in a six-man dorm room and <laughs> what at one time was a convent. Oh, wow. <laughs> So that's kind of my introduction into chiropractic yeah. at a very, very young age. And, and I know that you are um, you know, very involved with um, NUCA, the uh, National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association. And, and when did you start getting involved with, the, um, with uh, that uh, form of upper cervical care? Well, I came out of Palmer College uh, pretty well using a a uh, combination of different ways to work on the spine and what I call segmental now most people call full spine adjusting but I was um, I came out of Palmer I opened a practice in downtown Tulsa with no parking and not very much access for patients and a friend of mine from Mississippi convinced me to go to a DE meeting in Atlanta so I went to my first DE meeting came home and closed that first office moved to a little town of Tahlequah Oklahoma and put a quarter page picture of my face in the newspaper and I saw 10 new patients my first day. I was seeing 100 patient visits a day in 30 days and almost 200 patient visits a day within 60 days and I did that for two years working on a Thompson ter terminal point adjusting table and basically in a two room office. Oh, wow. <laughs> I had a waiting room and an adjusting room that was it. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. And so I was living on a 37-acre farm just outside of the town, but what occurred for me at, while I was at Palmer is they had dug up some of the old green books that B.J. Palmer had written in the basement before I graduated, and they didn't know what to do with them, so they were selling them off in the bookstore, and I bought them because I thought they would look good in my library someday. <laughs> and so I was seeing patients in the daytime and reading the green books at night. And by the time I'd been in practice there for about two and a half years, I'd basically been through every one of BJ's green books. Now, that then created a whole other transition because, you know, here I am adjusting people two or three times a week, sometimes every day, and I've got a high volume going, but there's got to be a better way to do this. There's got to be a better way that I can correct a spine without having to adjust it over and over and over again. So on December the 5th, 1975, I turned around after seeing 168 patients, locked the door and walked away. And I spent the next 18 months going to eight chiropractic college libraries and taking 42 different technique courses to work on the spine. And that's how I wound up with NUCA. It was uh, November of 1977 that I was in Monroe, Michigan. I'd already done a lot of studying about how the spine works and what we have to do to work on it. And I'm sitting in this classroom with Dr. Ralph Gregory, who's the founder of NUCA, and I asked him a question. And it was every place I'd been, you know, if A was true and B is true, therefore C is true. Well, I asked Gregory this question, and he said, I don't know. And it was the first place in chiropractic that I'd been <laughs> that somebody knew what they knew and knew what they didn't know, and they were going to be totally objective about it. And so I spent the next several years basically attending every program that Gregory put on. And for the first five years of that, I was trying to prove him wrong. <laughs> After five years of taking pre and post x-rays and trying to prove him wrong, I said, he, he really does have it pretty much figured out. So that was my first conference in 1977. And by 1979, I'd actually already been elected to the board of directors of NUCA. And so I've been a very, very strong supporter in the orthogonal aspect of how to correct the upper cervical spine since 1979. Now, 
I got there from Toggle Recoil and Blair and Nichest, and I mean, I got there, and even though in today's world, as a member of the Upper Cervical Council that's creating the Diplomate Program for the ICA in Upper Cervical Chiropractic, I see the validity of all of these approaches. We're all looking at the truth. We're just looking at it from different perspectives. And so regardless of whichever cervical procedure is used, there is an element of truth to it. One of my favorite teachers is Ken Wilber, who says no one can be 100% wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my long-term history with NUCA. And, of course, since then, and in, in the... Um, mid-1990s I was actually made the chairman of the board of NUCA and then in uh, the early 2000s I was made chairman of the board of the research group and uh, have actually authored bylaws and restructured organization and um, so I have a, a long political history there as well as quite a long political history at Palmer where I was made alumnus of the year in 1992 was president of the Alumni Association, was actually considered to be the president of the college at one time. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, um, so. you know, I had a, you know, a wonderful experience visiting your office in Tulsa. And one of the things that um, I felt when I came there was very um, comfortable. I was, you know, I felt like at home. It was, uh, you know, a, a, like a wonderful experience for sure. And, you know, um, like something that, like stuck out to me um, when you were kind of discussing things about really taking care of people. Um, what does taking care of people really mean to you? Well, that's a really interesting question because since 1995, I basically have a seminar company and the name of it is Taking Care of People. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened for me after converting from the segmental approach to chiropractic to the upper cervical approach, my results had become so profound, I really didn't have to communicate with people. I could just say it's magic. <laughs> and so after doing that for several years, finally I said, okay, I've got to find a way to communicate this to the people that I'm taking care of. And what I did is something that was, I have no idea how this happened, but it was so profound. I started asking people at the end of every patient encounter, are there any questions? And are there any questions? And are there any questions? And what I learned over the next five years of doing that was that basically the same questions arise in almost everyone's mind about the spine and how to take care of it. And so what I've done is I've actually created a communication package for taking care of people based on the answers to all of those questions. And I have them in eight contexts that we actually can, act, can lay out to a student or a doctor that helps them communicate what it is that we do with patients and enroll them in taking care of their spine for as long as they live. Now, I've had over a thousand students and doctors go through my taking care of people class so it's been quite productive and there's lots of people out there that are using the concepts that I developed back in the 1980s and early 1990s. But yeah. taking care of people to me is a non-interference philosophy and in healthcare there's two philosophies. One of those is what I call intervention and it means we come fundamentally flawed we're gonna have things go wrong we can't heal and recover from we're gonna have breakdowns and we're gonna need outside help to be okay and we're gonna need somebody smarter than we are to help us manage that the other side of the philosophy of healthcare is what I call non-interference and in non-interference it looks like this I basically have the ability to heal and recover from virtually anything and adapt to anything I can't heal and recover from. I'm also going to be wise enough to make my own decisions. And David, if you will assist me here, I'd like for you to just say these words. It's my body. It's my body. And so in healthcare, <laughs> sometimes we forget that it's my body. Yeah. And when we turn it over to somebody else, we're automatically over there on the intervention paradigm but we are wise enough to make our own decisions and following the true principles of chiropractic philosophy and the innate wisdom we have inside, the real key here is to learn to listen to that. Now, I'm going to simplify that a lot. If I have a rubber band around the finger, it doesn't do a lot of good to diagnose and treat the finger until I take the rubber band off. Now, there can still be something wrong with the finger, but the non-interference paradigm says I need to deal with that first and the intervention second. So here would be a story. When I was seven, I had my next door neighbor give me a box of 200 pieces of barrel bubble gum. By age nine, I've got 20 cavities. <laughs> it's too late to get rid of the bubble gum. 
Exactly. Right now, I need some intervention. So there are times that intervention becomes absolutely necessary, but what's missing in healthcare is non interference. And that's the role that a, a chiropractor can fit into and play very, very well is to find the things that interfere with life, especially the structural things, correct those, and life is better with everything lined up than it is when it's not. Exactly. Life full, life less than full, life full. It's just a real basic idea, but it's fairly simple. But for me, taking care of people is to make sure that everything in my practice fits the non-interference paradigm. And so when you come to visit my office, I'm going to help you find your answers. I'm not going to have them for you because that fits the non-interference paradigm. Do you see what I'm saying there? Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons that people in our practice are fairly comfortable is because we're helping them find their own answers, not having them for them. Now, we can give people choices, and some of the choices may be appropriate. But we're not going to be telling people what to do, essentially. That's in the intervention paradigm. So... And so what would be your greatest advice for um, a chiropractic student? Um, the first thing that I would suggest to a chiropractic student is don't donate your body to science until after you die. <laughs> <laughs> or you're going through your educational process. Watch what everybody else does to the spine, but don't donate your spine to it. <laughs> because anything that has a potential for great good has an equivalent potential for great harm. And so a lot of people have spinal issues that perhaps have been created by things that have been done to the spine and it's something we don't own a lot in chiropractic but that's my first thing <laughs> I'd like to say to students and I'll back that up a little bit. I've 57 of my patients have become chiropractors and that is the very first thing that I say to them. Now, you know, I was a chiropractic student a lot of years ago. This is, um, let's see, in fact I started I matriculated chiropractic school in 1963, so I'm 50 years in here. <laughs> so I'm not an 18 or 20-something any longer myself, but I have been interacting within student communities at a lot of the colleges for a lot of years. And I would look at everything and look at everything and find the things, not that work best for you as the doctor, but that work the best for the people you take care of because it's all about what we do for the people we take care of not what we're doing for us now I'm a firm believer that I do good good service and I do good business don't get me wrong about that I get paid well for what I do but it's really important that the first priority is what are we going to do to take care of people and how is it going to affect their life their well-being and their physical mental emotional social and even spiritual development because without interference, life is simply different. Exactly. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing with us today. If you want some more information or want to connect directly with Dr. Brooks, check out the links below. Every week I'll be uploading a new interview with another chiropractor. And, and if you like this video, uh, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this YouTube channel. My name is Dave Tran, and this was Lux TV, Shedding and Spreading Life.